Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 15301530, and all of you regular listeners know what that means. That means this is a 10th episode show where we go off topic and discuss something of general interest. And today, I know it's going to be tough to say this one, but we have a fantastic interview with Gary John Bishop. This guy is... He's just on the spot. You know, he gets it. Some people get it. He is a, I guess, a, a motivational speaker or maybe a, a just get your act together speaker. And he taught me some good things during this interview. And I think you'll you'll really get a lot out of this interview. He's uh, got incredibly good selling New York Times bestselling books. I'm looking at one of them on Amazon right now with almost 5,000 ratings. Now, I don't know if you (laughs) look around and look at the reviews and ratings on uh, Amazon, for example, and almost 5,000 ratings, 4.7 stars. So this is good stuff. And it is Gary John Bishop, the author of Unf*** Yourself, Get Out of Your Head and Into Your Life. So we will get to his interview in just a moment. But first, a couple of things. You know, it is amazing how many of these predictions are coming true. The predictions I made many, many months ago in February and March. And in COVID time, that's like dog years. That is a long, long time ago, even though it's only several months ago to us humans. But to dogs, it's a long time ago. (laughs) Dog years. Dog years apply to this situation with pandemic investing. Look at Google search, the search for the phrase, quote, movers near me, unquote, hit a record high, a record high, that search phrase hit a record high at the end of July. So there you go. You can tell this trend. I'm looking at a chart right now, and it is, wow, that chart is, it's a hockey stick, basically. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Just shot through the roof, just like the work at home phrase shot through the roof at the beginning of the pandemic. So there we go. Also, another prediction coming true. Thank you to Evan, who posted this in our content group. Daily foot traffic to Home Depot stores since April has been running at least 35% above last year's traffic. So year-over-year increase in foot traffic at Home Depot up 35% according to Unacast Incorporated, which tracks location data from 25 million cell phones on a given day. In 26 states, traffic doubled following the surge in late May. This was another one of my predictions, that home improvement projects would become really, really popular. And for people selling home goods, home furniture, home improvement, contractors, all of these businesses would flourish during and especially in this kind of, we can't call it post-pandemic, but after the third inning, right? And just wait till the seventh inning stretch now that we're using sports metaphors. (laughs) But yeah, it, it is a big deal. The home is the center of the universe. And this is where people are obviously spending their time and spending their money. I just interviewed an expert from Adam Data Solutions, and, you know, they've been on the show many times over the years, and he shared all kinds of data about why those who are trying 
to time the market and they're waiting for some big crash are going to be wrong. And how, frankly, even though he says foreclosure activity will pick up a bit, but still extremely bullish on the real estate market, the residential real estate market, the low density suburban housing market we talked about even more specifically, of course. And these are amazing times with amazing opportunities. Looking at another article here, and this is an article from Housing Wire, says more people are fleeing San Francisco and New York City for the suburbs. Most are moving out of Silicon Valley and NYC, and uh, just goes on to talk about that. Uh, But interestingly, it says, particularly millennials are fleeing New York City for more space in surrounding suburbs. And here's another prediction. I want to give you a a nuance on, on my prediction there. So we're going to see this happen in phases. At first, what we see is, is for people who can afford it. Obviously, you know, take New York City as an example because it's it's compact. So it, it makes for a good example and good data. Wealthy people in New York City fleeing to the Hamptons, fleeing to those ritzy Connecticut areas, fleeing to Westchester County. We're seeing that now. But here will be the next wave, okay? Here's my prediction on the next wave, folks. Are you ready? The next wave will be that people move even further away. Now, of course, many are doing that already, but I'm just talking about what these two articles are saying, you know, that people are moving to like the surrounding burbs, if you will, the suburbs surrounding the cities. But what we will be seeing Uh, and and we're already seeing it, but we're going to see a lot more of it. We're going to see these people take a second wave move. They're going to take a second move, and they're going to say, hey, you know what? If I can still retain my job at Goldman Sachs, oh, I mean Goldman Sachs, and make that super high salary I was making when I worked in New York City, well, yeah, we thought, okay, let's move to Westchester County uh, so that if I do need to go to the office, uh, you know, I can still do it. I can still commute. But then they're going to wake up again one day, maybe after living there in the home that they leased for a year, they signed a one-year lease maybe, and they're going to say, you know what? Why do we even need to live in Westchester County? What's the point? Westchester County ain't cheap either. I mean, New York City, you know, living in Manhattan is more expensive. But we could live in Florida and we could have great weather, the ocean. With all this extra money, we could have a boat. We could have a mansion. You know, we could have a lot of things or a lot of just extra money. We could do more investing, do more savings. Just remember, this is the concept. What we're experiencing now is is kind of a form of, of what Tim Ferriss kind of popularized with his book, The 4-Hour Workweek, back in, what, 2008 or so. It's called geo-arbitrage. Now, he did not invent that term, but he he was one of the people that popularized it a bit. And I I certainly talk about it a lot on my Jet Setter show. And I talk about lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide on that show. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing uh, this this concept of geo-arbitrage. Let me just back up and explain that for a moment. The concept was that if you live in the U.S., you probably have, in many places in the U.S., a, a fairly high cost of living. And you could leave that high cost of living area in which you you live, right? And I'm not saying you, but just as a the, the sample person here, the avatar person, and you could move to a foreign country, which is one of the things he talked about a lot. And, you know, there were a lot of uh, foreign countries you could move to, and you could dramatically lower your cost of living. And the thesis was experience a very nice lifestyle. Now, having explored this uh, a lot myself, you know, it's pretty mixed, frankly. I, I don't. Tim Ferriss lives in the U.S., okay? I had dinner with him and uh, Pat Donahoe and Ryan Moran about, what, two years ago now or something that was? And we had dinner. We had a, we had literally, my dinner with Tim Ferriss was a four-hour dinner. 
I kid you not. Yeah, he wrote the book, The 4-Hour Body, The 4-Hour Workweek, The 4-Hour uh, Chef. Well, we had a four-hour dinner. <laughs> he is quite a foodie, and he kept ordering more and more stuff. And we sat there at a restaurant in Austin, Texas, for four hours when he just moved there and left Silicon Valley thinking, why do I need to live here? It's so expensive. It's ridiculous. And I could live better in Austin. So he geo-arbitraged a little bit. And that's what these people are doing. So what the Americans in the, in the international perspective of geo-arbitrage found is that they could leave the U.S., go live somewhere else. And their money was so powerful. It's like suddenly you went from being a small fish in a big expensive pond maybe living in New York City or Miami or on the West Coast of the U.S., any of these cyclical markets that we don't recommend investing in. You could leave those places. You could go live in one of many foreign countries, and you're suddenly a big fish in a small pond, and it's an inexpensive pond, and you could live like a king. And here's what we're finding now. As these people drain out of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Seattle. They leave all of these, and, you know, Seattle wasn't really a super expensive market uh, for a long time. It, it's sort of a somewhat, not, not completely, but somewhat recent phenomenon. As they drain out and they take their money with them, what they find is that it's it's like traveling to one of these countries where you're geo-arbitraging, where your currency is really strong and the prices in your new locale are really, really low. So your money spends really well. And suddenly you've got all this extra money to spend. So even though we have this very uneven economic mess on our hands, some people are doing quite well, even better than before. A lot of the unemployed people were making more money being unemployed than they were going back to work. That's why the that's why their employers, when things started opening up again, couldn't get them to come back in. They're like, why should I work? I'm making more money sitting at home watching Netflix, right? So, you know, these are all complex issues, but it's pretty interesting stuff, folks. Anyway, we'll continue to talk about it. Obviously, we've got all week to do that. By the way, we had a great live stream yesterday with our investment counselor, Adam. You can watch that on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page at jasonhartman.com or many of our other Facebook pages. So I'd encourage you to make sure you check out that live stream we did yesterday. And of course, we've got another one coming up this Sunday. And I don't know, we have a lot to talk about. Maybe we'll even do one before that, but definitely on Sunday. And what else? Oh, for those of you who purchased VIP tickets to Meet the Masters, we've got the first VIP follow-up implementation session on Thursday evening, East Coast time. So Thursday evening, 8 o'clock East Coast and 5 o'clock Pacific time. And so join us for that. You've already received an email. And those of you who joined the Empowered Investor Network Inner Circle are now in the group and we're getting that going. So that's very exciting. I think that's going to be one of the the best things we've done. So very, very excited about that. A lot of good stuff coming up. Anyway, without further ado, let's get to our guest and let's talk about how to... Un F U C K yourself. <laughs> it's a great book and really highly reviewed. So uh, check this out. I think you'll really, really enjoy this interview with Gary John Bishop on how to get out of your head and into your life. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Gary John Bishop to the show. You've heard his name. He has sold so many books, and they are really unbelievable. He's the New York Times bestselling author of Un-F Yourself, Get Out of Your Head and Into Your Life, several other books, Stop Doing That, S-H. <laughs> I bet people always get stuck introducing you with these titles, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and Do the Work and a bunch of others. He's got a new one that's just an audio-only book. And we're going to dive into his very unique and innovative philosophy of life. So I'm looking forward to it. Gary, welcome. How are you? I'm great. And thanks for having me on your show. It's good to have you. And you're coming to us from Orlando area. Is that correct? 
Correct, right here in the sunny Central Florida belt. Not too far from me in Palm Beach. Well, good stuff. Well, you know, you have sold so many books. I mean, uh, give us the latest tally on your numbers and congratulations on your success as an author. Well, on on the first book, um, it's over 2 million copies now. And that book is very, it's definitely unique from my publisher's perspective, HarperCollins. Um, I'm the only author ever to have breached a million audio books. So that was a kind of big deal. And the books, I guess it is surprising to me. They continue to sell um, like consistently every week. Like the numbers really don't go down. It's it's like the steady stream of people doing this kind of work on themselves. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, in your most popular book, the Unf Yourself book, you start off chapter one asking the question, you know, have you ever felt like a hamster on the wheel, uh, on a wheel, furiously churning your way through life and somehow going nowhere. I think we've all felt that way at one time or another. So maybe that's a good place to start. Yeah, I th- I, there's a lot to be said for, you know, because I think in the day-to-day living of a life, we have general thoughts about how we're doing and how life's doing and how, you know, overall how I'm feeling. But it's kind of something's very challenging to tell yourself the truth about how you really feel about something or or maybe what the impact of something really is on you. And that's a lot of what I, I wanted people to deal with in this book, like this opportunity for you to really tell one on yourself, right? To put together, to put aside the the kind of shellac, if you like, and start to reveal some of your innermost struggles. Uh, now, reveal uh, to oneself or to others or both? Well, I, I definitely initially oneself. Most people think they are honest with themselves. You know, it's uh, of all the people I've ever met, when I first start talking to them, most of them would say, I, I do tell myself the truth. But once you start to dig away at it, you'll see how a lot there's a lot of things in your life you're still convincing yourself about. And you have to do it repeatedly. You have to keep convincing yourself about it. And you have to keep reminding yourself that you're over it. You have to keep reminding yourself that you don't care. And uh, a big part of my work is finally telling the truth to yourself, Mm -hmm. which is the best place to start. Right. Well, that's. I think that goes back to maybe the unexamined life not worth living uh, concept, right? Because we've well, sure. got, we've got to first uh, be honest with ourselves. That's true. So you know, in the Do the Work book, you really reveal specific steps that one right. can follow to right. doing the inner work on one's life, and and we all have to do that at some stage or another. I'd say maybe most people do that kind of in their 20s, uh, maybe their early 20s, when they're sort of finding themselves, if you will. But then again, whenever a crisis comes up, maybe, maybe it's just a general midlife crisis or, you know, uh, marriage, divorce, whatever, things like that, death in the family, or getting fired, it'll cause us to examine, right? These are uh, things that are an impetus to that. But do you have some specific steps that you offer to unfing oneself? Yeah. A great place to begin is to to kind of, and again, it all has to start with some kind of truth, which a lot of people ignore or or resist because it seems like it's not a positive thing, right? It seems like, oh, this is too negative for me, so let me focus over here where things and keep things on the sunny side. But I say to people, very simply, look at an area of your life you feel as if you're tolerating something, either yourself, something about yourself, some circumstance, some relationship. And look at where am I currently just explaining or I've become okay with. And that's when you start to kind of zero in on something. And you'll and what you will see as a human being is your tremendous capacity for tolerating, for putting up with, and then overcoming. Overcoming on the surface might seem fine, but in fact, it's really just this constant stream of trying to make something okay that fundamentally you're not okay with. Mm-hmm. So I, I like to ask people the kind of questions where if you told the truth to yourself, for instance, about, let's say, your procrastination, right? If somebody's procrastinating. What's it really like for you when you when you know yourself as a procrastinator, right? What's it really like? For, what's been the impact on you and your life or you and your career or you and your finances? And how do you explain that to yourself? And how do you explain it to other people? And you'll see that in the areas of your life that don't work as well as you would want them to, you're actually putting a lot of work into making that palatable, 
mm-hmm. for yourself. You're right. And yeah. so that's a big part of the revealing, like that you start to see what you've burdened yourself with. Like you said, we as humans have an amazing capacity to sort of rationalize, justify. But, you know, the question is, maybe... Is that all bad? It, it seems bad in this in the context of this conversation, but you know maybe that's yeah. a survival mechanism, right? That's just built it in is. to all of us, so we can right. kind of get by. At some level, we do have to accept things like the yeah. the prayer of Saint Francis, right? You know, change the things I can, accept the things I can't change, right? So where yeah. do we draw the line on that? I guess. Well, St. Francis and I might have different points of view about that. (laughs) With all the respect in the world to St. Francis, my view is you're way more encumbered by what you think than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So you're way more burdened by your own limitations. People live with a complete illusion that they're interacting with life. Mm -hmm. You're not interacting with life. You're constantly interacting with your own view of it. You're not interacting with how it is. You're interacting with how you think it is. Right. That's a veil that you never really quite get in touch with your life until you start. You can step back a bit and see the matrix of your own thoughts mm-hmm. and the matrix of your own emotions and the matrix of your own automatics. And you don't have to reveal all of that in one go. By the way, you can reveal little bits of that that would sometimes shock you to your core mm-hmm. when you see how you've kind of funneled yourself away from your own satisfaction funneled yourself away from your own fulfillment in favor of some subconscious belief or some subconscious idea. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing wrong with being able to overcome. Overcoming is fine. But I think it's full, fully proper to look at your life in terms of, am I realizing on my existence? Mm-hmm. Or, or am I shelving parts of myself in favor of some explanation. Gary, do you want to share any examples of these things, you know, maybe from some of your readers that they've shared with you? You, you just did an audio book on this. And, right. um, you know, maybe there are some specific examples. I just thought I'd open up that door for you if, if yeah. they make sense at this point or, yeah. or maybe later in some of the other steps. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that people often struggle with is this notion of forgiveness. How do I forgive somebody? Most people just, if you have a fairly positive attitude, you'll just say, well, you know, I'll just let that go. Mm -hmm. The problem is you have no capacity for letting go. You only have a capacity for overcoming. You know, capacity for actually just releasing yourself from something. How do you know that? Because the things that you haven't let go of, you get reminded of them every now and again. Then you tell yourself you're okay with it, but then you let it go. So there's things like they keep coming up in your mind. You get reminded and a little hooked, a little triggered. So... People are often asking me, like, how do I forgive someone or something? Which is, we were never taught how to forgive. We are taught we should. We should forgive another human being. But there are other steps to it. Yes, there are steps to forgiveness. And mostly what we're left with is some kind of morality-based forgiveness, which ends up being, I'm better than you. So I'll forgive you. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Which is morality. That's, uh, I don't do morality yeah, right? Right. that way. So if you look at forgiveness in terms of what do I get to justify about myself or my life by not forgiving, mm-hmm. now you're getting closer to something. Right. Now, like, what do I get to say about myself by not forgiving you? What do I get to hold on to? So, so you, get, you one, get to be right, in essence, very, right? Yeah. So eventually, I get to be right about something. And that is another thing that human beings just love. Mm-hmm. They just love being right, right, right? Even though they say, no, no, this isn't about being right, but right. I can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 but, but the funny thing is, and I found this in my own experience and, of course, in culture and lots of people, it's amazing the things that we'll just trash in favor of being right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll let go of a marriage. Mm-hmm. Sure. We'll let go of a business yeah. or an opportunity because I'm right. Yeah. Which – and I get it. I understand, right? And, and there's people are sometimes like, well, I am right. I know, but at what cost? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm right, but at what cost? Right, right. It cost peace of mind. So forgiveness for me begins with seeing your own kind of self-righteousness and how you use your, how you use your current situation to justify you. But I think a really important part is, and this is sometimes you've got to do a little bit of mental acrobatics for this. You've got to see yourself in other people. You, you gotta fight, you gotta see their logic. It's not your logic. It's not how you do it. 
But when you see somebody's logic, they make sense to you. Mm -hmm. And when somebody makes sense to me, I got a lot of compassion for them because I realize they don't have a whole lot of choice with that thing. It's just Mm -hmm. that thing, what it does. So I'm always at great pains to, I'm like a serial forgiver. And I'm a serial forgiver because I don't like who I am when I'm not, when Mm -hmm. I don't forgive. I don't like the man I become. Here's maybe the $64,000 question. Should we always forgive? Or are there times when forgiveness actually doesn't make sense? When I interview Dr. Laura someday, I'm going to ask her that question. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll answer it very. Yeah, you should always forgive for the sake of forgiveness. Right. So part of the reason I think why we struggle with forgiveness, too, by the way, is we feel as if it means something to the other person. Like somehow it gets them off the hook for whatever they did. Right. Maybe a distinction between forgiveness and accountability. Right. I'm okay with forgiving you. You've got to live your own choices. I'll forgive you because I want to disconnect myself from resentment. Mm -hmm. I'm unwilling to torture myself because of what you did. I'll forgive you. You might never play another role in my life. You and I might never connect again, but I want you to know I've forgiven you. You got to go sort that out for yourself. Mm-hmm. Whatever you did or didn't do, that's on you. But I am a serial forgiver and I forgive every time again because I just don't like what the lack of forgiveness of, or the rather the presence of resentment does to me. I don't I don't like being a resentful man. It's a horrible place to be. Um I'd much rather free myself from that to get on with whatever's next in my life mm-hmm. and to get myself fully to the people that are in my life. So I get that. Yeah. No, the forgiveness is really for yourself, for in sure. other words, right? That's yeah. a, that's like an internal exercise. Right. So what do you do in the external world? Yeah. You declare your forgiveness. Like, I, if I forgive you, I'm going to tell you. Uh-huh. I'll say I'll forgive you. However, this relationship is over or something. It might be something like that. Okay. Like I'm no longer willing. Right, right. I'm no longer going to work into this yeah. friendship anymore. And, but, and, but, but is it, hey, look, I, I forgive you for, you know, sneaking out on the debt you owe me, but you still have to pay me back. Or, uh, I, can, I can totally do that, yeah. by the way. And that's another great thing. Okay. Because I might, I might forgive you, it doesn't mean to say and you're now, you know, like, for instance, if it's if you owe me money, Suddenly that you don't owe me that money. No, right. I forgive you for the way you've paid me back and you're still on the hook for it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to make it mean anything about you. I'm not going to hold on to that you're this kind of person or that kind of person. But the reality is I forgive you and give me my cash. Yeah, right, right, right. I like that because uh, because I think a lot of people confuse that. They confuse it with, you know, walking away. When we come into like the, the biblical reference of turning the other cheek, where, right. where does that come into play with forgiveness in this discussion? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll quote Sartre, the French existentialist, and he said, life is empty and meaningless, right? So it doesn't mean anything. So I don't, if you've done something that I feel as if you shouldn't have done, I'm not going to indulge that emotional kind of sense of whatever loss, hurt, diminishing. I'm not going to indulge that. Well, I'm really just going to look at you know, like what you, who you and I are and what you and I had, for instance, in your case, if you say, well, it's somebody who owes me money, that's what this is about. I'm not going to make this mean something about me or I'm too weak with people. I'm not great with people or people are always trying to abuse me or take advantage of me. None of that. I'm just going to say, okay, look, I forgive you for whatever you've done and you do owe me that money. The only way out of that, by the way, and I've, and I've actually had this as an experience, I've had somebody owe me money for a long period of time. You know, use money as an example, I guess. But I've had people owe me money for a long period of time. And on a couple of occasions, I actually turned to them and said, um, so I want, I forgive you for not paying me back. And I'm now going to gift you that money. I don't, I'm no longer willing to live with this thing like an open wound in my life. Okay. So I'm going to gift it to you. Of course, you can rely on that I would never give you money again. Right. But... But uh, I'm gifting it to you, Mm -hmm. and I want you to know that I'm fully gifting it to you. It's not a favor. I don't want anything in return. Why do I do such a thing? Why why have I done that in my life? Because it's important to me that I close that thing. I don't want to leave that open there between me and life or between me and people. Oh, yeah, and then you can't do that because people owe you money or people cheat you. I'll close the loop. 
Now, what has that taught me? It's taught me, one, I'll be very careful about whoever I lend money to. Right? I'll be careful about that and responsible about that. But whenever I do, if I have lent somebody money in the past, I've been fully cognizant of the notion that I might not get this back. Right. So yeah. I no longer treat it like it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. It's part of the game, if you right, like. Right, right. That's a it's good, that's a good way to look at it. I like that. But it's yeah. part of the game. It's an unsavory yeah. part of the game, but it is part of the game. Right. Good stuff. We've talked a lot about forgiveness. Just wrap this up if there's anything more on this, because there's a lot more to your philosophy. And I just wanted yeah. to give you the opportunity to maybe share a couple more points before we wrap it up. Well, one of the things that really always jumps out at me is, um, you know, people often leave themselves helpless. They often leave them when they have no more ideas or no more sense of how to change their life or change what's next for them. I think the big thing that I want people to get is that that significant change is available to you, right? In every area of your life, by the way, with your emotional state, your moods, your body, your finances, your well-being, your friendships, your experience of love. All of those things are transformable. All of those things can be impacted. And even though it might seem impossible from where you're sitting right now, I do want people to know that it's available and it's maybe not as complicated nor take as long as one might think. Okay, so don't be the victim. Resources are available. They you, are. you are available. You you can change any of these things anytime you want. You can. And I'm not saying it's always it's always easy, but I'm telling you the pathway to significant change is an uncomplicated one. It might take you time and it might take you some things that you need to handle, but it's all doable. And I've and I've worked with people that have produced amazing results in their life with their finances, with their body, with a love life, with everything. Um, it's available to all human beings. I know it, you might be despondent or down or whatever, but it's available for you. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty empowering thought. I mean, if people want to change how they think about themselves or how they think about their, their station in life, that's the answer, isn't it? It is. It, look, we, we don't always enjoy our thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. or our opinions of ourselves. They often arise in moments of crisis. You know, like when we're most kind of down on ourselves. I'm not someone who says be positive about that stuff. I'm someone who says, all right, well, let's kind of get that on the table. What is that? Right. Mm -hmm. What is that really about? What does it do? And you don't always get a say in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, you have random thoughts. They come up, they disappear. But a lot of the times it feels the same emotionally. I don't always feel, you know, my best. Some people deal with anger, lack of confidence, things like that. It's amazing to me how people can often leave themselves with the experience that they're stuck with that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to you know in your heart of hearts, you're not. It's yeah. This is all doable. Right. All of it. So if you think to yourself, well, that's just the way I am, or that's just the right. way it is, those are just false statements, aren't they? They are. It's, it's funny, you know, <laughs> I've had this conversation with many people. People talk about self-limiting beliefs. The problem with self-limiting beliefs is you don't know yours mm -hmm. because you believe them. Right, because you're in it. That's the context out of which you operate, right? It's this box, and you don't you're know what's fish. outside of the box. Yeah, Right. You're the fish in water. Fish is no sense of water. Right. You yeah. have no sense of your beliefs. You just live them. Mm -hmm. You can see other people. And part of, I feel, is a good work that you do on yourself is revealing what you fundamentally believe, revealing your own sacred cows, what can, what is possible, what is impossible. And it's, it's people are, are more often than not completely shocked at the way they've boxed themselves in. Yeah, they sure are. That's Gary. That, that's, that's so good. It's, it's, it's great. Give out your website. You can reach me at, at Gary John Bishop dot com there's courses on there there's obviously great ways to connect with me on instagram and on the twitter and also on facebook i got uh, lots and lots of followers out there and i like to make sure i'm giving them plenty of good stuff every day so there's always great little nuggets of insight and thinking for you to do excellent how did you become uh, such a life a life philosopher um i guess uh, it started with working on myself uh -huh. and my own life and yeah. And then the more I got into it, the more I realized I loved impacting other people's lives. And I, I mm -hmm. became a senior program director for a really, really big personal development company. Mm -hmm. I did that for many years. Yeah. And then uh, 
yeah, it's just been this layering and layering and layering and layering and adding new information and, and thoughts and discussions yeah. such that I can give it away to people now. Good stuff. Any closing thought you want to share? Quote, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll give people one little thing that, that your success in life is almost exclusively tied to the degree that you can keep a promise to yourself. Mm, very good. Very good. Say it again. Your success in life is almost exclusively tied to the degree that you can keep a promise to yourself. Excellent. Gary John Bishop, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.